Dan Jaldum, Guaranteed Rate. Thank you so much for being Thanks here. Thanks for having me again. It's a pleasure to be here. People love getting the insight from you and really just want to continue sharing on a higher level so that people can understand as we navigate this very challenging roller coaster of year kind of what we're seeing what we're doing and what it all means to us so i'm going to dive right in this is something that you and i were just talking about because i think there's been more discussion on this lately than i've heard in years what does it mean for somebody to buy points in their mortgage and is this something that you're seeing more of now because i feel like we are that takes us back to when rates were at eight percent let's say okay Points were never, I've been doing this since 1997. Yeah, let's start. What, what is a, a point? One point is 1% of the loan amount. And what do we do with the, the point? So typically That's it's That's like used, the Facebook yes, and exactly. the Instagram. Yes, so the point. I just was, aged myself by like three decades, everybody. I picked everybody. up on it though, because I'm old too. Um, older, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> you're like, Ooh, this is getting <laughs> real heated around here, people. Um, so one point is 1% of the loan amount. And the typical purpose for that historically was to make your rate lower. But when rates went up, we had to charge points to actually get pricing on loans. Like there was a set top rate that we could find in the market and you had to pay to get it. So that's when points went into play. The purpose of points now that the, the way people are using it is to make, um, to make the rate lower. Right. So, but the problem with points in a projected downward rate environment is that paying one point for the most part is a two year break even. Okay. And what I mean by that is the cost of that point compared to the payment difference that you'd get between the zero point and the one point rate, the amount of months that that point takes to be made up. So, if we're thinking we're going to refi in 12 to 18 months, but the upfront cost of that point is a 24 month timeline, it's not worth doing, sure. right? And and the fact of the matter is that on a, you pay more, you get higher interest deduction for a higher interest rate. So, you know, there's a, that 24 months is kind of moved to 26, 27. Okay, no, that's, that's very, very helpful because you and I talked a lot about it. We used to see people buy down points when, when the interest rates were very low, right? If they were low and we didn't expect them to go lower and you were buying into a house that you were planning on being for, for a longer time, then it made sense. Yep. But then when they hit their premium and we, you know, last year when we were telling everybody you're going to refinance this loan at some point, then it didn't make as much sense. But as you're explaining, there was certain pricing that wasn't even available without it. Right, absolutely. So. Okay, that's helpful because I, I know it's a little bit of a cloudy topic. And just so we're clear, that is different than a seller buy down in terms of buying down the rates. We're not going to go down that rabbit hole right now, but that is a different type of rate buy down. Here's another great question, right? We have people that are, we're finally getting a little bit more inventory. They're finally going under contract. And there's all this media about our rates going to go down, our rates going to go up. Well, if they go down, do I want to lock in right now? In your opinion, somebody goes under contract today, our advice typically is going to be with them, go ahead and lock in ASAP. Now, as a consumer, I'm thinking, well, what if rates go down in the next two weeks? Wouldn't I be in a better position to wait for that to happen to lock in? Can you speak a little bit to that? Because I think people are always a little confused when the media says rates might be getting better and our advice is to lock in quickly. Yeah, so number one, the media, And I don't speak badly about this, but the media goes off data that is old. So all of the reports, they'll cite Freddie Mac's interest rate reports. Those are always a week old, right? They're not going and saying, what's the rate right now to, you know, I don't have CNBC calling me and say, Dan, what's the rate today, right? I could tell them exactly where rates are today. Um, But so when the media reports that, it's always a little stale. So um, just this week, we had a really bad inflation report and interest rates went up a quarter to three eighths of a point in one day. Wasn't it, it was the largest increase since. Yeah, it was, I, the whole. Six to 12 months. I yeah, mean, it, it was, was a, a much time. higher expected number. So yeah. the market freaked out about it. So rates can go up uh, again, a quarter or three eighths of a point in one day, right? We had people that locked in the day before as, you know, counseled them as, hey, there's a big report coming out tomorrow. Just lock in, cause we can always go lower we can, it's called a float down. We have a, everyone has a one-time float down between the day after they lock and up to five days before their closing date, if rates move a quarter point or more. Okay, just 
let's discuss this because this is a big thing. This is a program through guaranteed rate. So not all lenders have access right. to it. Some may, yep. but not all do. So you're saying, and you and I just had this conversation with my dad, my dad's under contract, and dad was reading the newspaper and saying, I don't know if I want to. We had him lock in, which thankfully we did now because rates look much uglier yes. than when he did last week, knowing that between now and five days before his closing, if those rates get more advantageous, there is a free adjustment down to that rate. So yep. in theory, you're creating a ceiling of where the rate can't go above. Yeah, and that's how exactly how I describe it too. It's we're setting a ceiling and the floor can move, right? right? And um, when we have, Whoa. and the way we work yeah. uh, on my team is when we see those a good day when rates are gonna go lower, we actually go through all of our locked loans to see if anybody can benefit from it. And then we reach out and it might be a quick text like, hey, Amanda, rates just dropped. We can do this today, right? If we do it once, we're done. But here's your opportunity. If you'd like to do it, just text me back. We'll start the process. So, awesome. yeah. I.e. saying to somebody that they can buy the same house at the same price and it costs them less. Correct. Absolutely. And it's, I'd it's like something to say, I'd be like, I'd like to be the person on your team that gets to send out those texts every day. Right. I do. They send them to me <laughs> right. and then I look like the hero. But as you can attest, we did that. I don't even know. I mean, probably a, a times. dozen times. A lot of times. In the last, just this year. yeah, exactly. Oh, for certain. And I just wanted to go back to, we talk about it a lot on this podcast, but you brought up the media again. And I always think I had a client that worked in journalism behind the scenes with regards to their ad sales. And the media is very good at what they do, but the consumer tends to think that their job is a little bit different than what their job is. They need to be profitable. To be profitable, they need to have engagement. To have engagement, they have to invoke emotion. The media's job is to either get you very, very excited or very, very scared. Those are the emotions that make you click. It's called clickbait for a reason and want to know more, right? So the story isn't always what the headline says. Yeah, and if it was, we would advertise all of our rates <laughs> with one or two points right. and make them look great. And then when people reach out, they're like, oh, by the way, it's gonna cost you. <laughs> There's a tiny you know, itty bitty disclosure down here. Yeah.